Good evening, and thank you for being here this evening. Uh, Linda Schaefer is the wife of, the, of Jean Vasper's friend that goes to India. She did pass away on November the 7th, and uh, services are scheduled for November the 13th in Kearney, Nebraska. And be sure to see the announcement in the bulletin about the showers of silver bags in the fellowship hall. Uh, you can make those donations through November the 25th, and... Be sure to look at those books and Bibles and see if there's one that you'll be able to, to use and take it with you. And if you'll turn to, in your books to 235, M235, let all that is within me. Let all that is within me cry worthy. Let all that is within me cry worthy. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Let all that is within me cry risen let all that is within me cry risen risen 
risen, risen, risen is the Lamb that was slain. Let all that is within me cry, come in. Let all that is within me cry, come in. Come in, come in, come in is the Lamb that was slain. Let all that is within me cry, Jesus. Let all that is within me cry, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the Lamb that was slain. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for this day. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to be able to come here and, and take this break from our week and really focus on what's important and fellowship with one another and uh, study from your word and, and worship you. We pray, Father, that uh, just as we go about our daily lives, that we're always looking for opportunities to, uh, to bless other people and to encourage other people to think more about you. Uh, and Father, especially at this time when our community is um, dealing with an increased number of, of people who have the virus, we pray that you'd give us strength and put a hedge around us as a congregation and keep us safe and keep us healthy. And, and we pray that um, just as the um, community is seeing some, uh, some difficult times and negative things happening, we pray that uh, you would use us as instruments of your peace and instruments of your will to, uh, to show people love and, and encouragement. Uh, we pray that you be with all of our uh, members who are um, struggling at this time, dealing with various issues. We pray that uh, they would be healed, that they would be comforted, that they would be uh, made strong once again. We pray all these things through your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey Gary, hey, Jason. your microphone's up here. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Wow, this is. Hey Gary, guess what? What? Hadn't seen you in a long time. I know. It's been forever. How was your trip to Texas? It was great. Thanks for asking. Well, yeah. it, it was kind of okay. Have yeah. you ever been to Lubbock, Texas? I've been there a time or two. Just because your son lives there? He does. Yes, he's become a Lubbock, Lubbockonian. Lub, Lubbockonian Lubbockite. Lubbockite? Okay. Yep. He, uh, you know the airport just north of Lubbock? I, I'm aware of that airport. You're driving into Lubbock. Yeah. And did fine until just then. And then the van... Can you hear me? Did it no. Went, did it went go go? This is the new headset. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Ah man. I'm gonna have to get a lapel mic. Can you hear me now? Oh man. Huh? Kinda. It is. It is. I feel like I'm really loud. Yeah. You're really loud, and I'm really soft. Maybe maybe you just kept turning mine up and thinking, that, yeah. okay, there. Am I here now? Oh, yeah. There I'm, we I'm go. Pressing. Okay. That okay, we're, we're at the airport in Lubbock, Texas. Lubbock, Texas airport. And my check engine light goes on in the Coming van. Coming home or going there? Going down. Okay, well, at least you were close. Unless I was headed that way. And so the next day I went to the local car parts place. And <laughs> what's that? <laughs> oh, no, not this one. It's, I'm not going to name the name, but it's, a, it's an Irish name. Uh, but they were great, and they read the the code on my uh, on the car, uh -huh. and it was an EGR valve. If you're going to change something on a car, change the EGR valve. That is the easiest thing to get to on an automobile. Have you ever changed your EGR valve? I didn't know there was one. I I haven't even seen an EGR valve until this time, and I've worked on cars for 70 years. Well, I didn't start when I was zero, but 
<laughs> they had cars back then. They had cars. <laughs> <laughs> they were those pedal cars, you know, like uh, like it's made out of yeah. logs, and you kind of go like this yeah. with your feet. <laughs> and so I got that, and I got that put on, and that was a good thing. That is a good thing. But on the way down, we stopped in uh, Mead, Kansas for gas. You know where Mead I've, is? I've been there. There are two things that Mead is famous for. Yes. The Dalton, Dalton gang. gang hideout and Love's Travel Plaza. <laughs> and loves, that's the third one. Uh, the other one is it is the hometown of Cody, Cody, Cody Marceau. Marceau. There's a big sign out going into town that says hometown of Cody <laughs> Marceau. And so we stopped there at that, uh, at that station and there's a trim piece on the top of the car that's just kind of like this. We said this is not good. That's not, and yeah. so we stopped at the dollar store and bought some glue and some tape. We got Gorilla Glue and Gorilla Tape. Now, I used to think that tape is tape and glue is glue, mm -hmm. but those things are angry. Yes. I mean, they are angry. And so I got some tape, and I taped it down till we get to Lubbock, and then when I got to Lubbock, I uh, got the glue out, and I taped it down. And But when I took that tape off, oh no. yeah, you know how you like to, I wanted to kind of do it like this so it didn't stick to anything. Have, have you ever, we used to call them Chinese handcuffs where you put your fingers in them, but you, the harder you pull, well, I used this finger to wrap that that gorilla tape, and then it sealed up on this side, and I realized I'm going to have to amputate that thing. <laughs> and Jason is going to say, "You got that caught in the router table, yeah, didn't exactly. you?" Exactly. Yeah. I. Yeah. I That's all I could think of. There. That's all I could think of. I was going to have to cut it off right about there, and I finally got that gorilla tape off of there, but it was it was hard. Do you, you, it had been a while. You had a bunch of story stories. Uh, well, I'm not through. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember about two and a half weeks ago on Sunday morning, you asked if I had any ideas for your Does the Bible Really Say That series? I do. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, you probably remember what you had two weeks ago, the sermon that you had two weeks ago. Two weeks ago um, was the, the one about... Uh, um, God helps those who help themselves. And what you didn't know that Sunday when you asked me that question was the night before we had gotten Chinese as we do every week so we can take, I translate the, t the sermon into, into Chinese and take it over to, to Jambo so he knows what it says. You have hidden talents. Uh, well, it's hidden, it's, hidden right in, it's hidden in Google Translate. Google Translate, yeah. And so what you didn't know was my fortune Oh no! from the night before. And so are you familiar with the contents of this envelope? Have you I, I ever have seen this? Is, this? is this a great Karnacki here? It is. <laughs> Will you please verify for the people out there that it is appropriately sealed? The, uh, it is sealed. Well, how do you know it's sealed? It has a sticker of a seal on it. <laughs> a seal. It's a marking yeah, it's yeah, it's seal. Yeah, uh, it's appropriately sealed. It is sealed. It's, yeah, we could make a hat out of that thing. Okay, so the night before you asked me that question, that was the fortune in my cookie from the Imperial Gardens. And okay. will you please open the sealed envelope and read it to our listening audience? You know, I've got a bad finger here. <laughs> oh, luck helps those who help themselves. I rest my case. <laughs> I'm not sure what we just proved. Well, the, the night before <laughs> you asked me, I had that, and then telepathically that week I transmitted that to you, and then you preached on God, God helps, helps those, those who, who help themselves. themselves. That is remarkable. Isn't that awesome? So, Are we through for the evening? Um, hey, Gary. Hey, what? We're getting our puppy on Saturday. Awesome. I was going to ask you about that puppy. Yeah. So everything's okay, shots and everything. And it's Yeah, she just texted me a minute ago while the, you were talking. The dog did? The, not, no, the, the foster mom. Oh, okay. Yeah. So We have... Yeah. Our our remote works better than it did last time, but we also are controlling it with my laptop computer, and so we can go forward and backward with this or that, and you can read it right here, and we don't have to squint so much. So what are we going to talk about tonight? Ezekiel chapters 24 and 25, if we have time after that. We may not have time for that. Ezekiel 24 and 25. Well, let's begin with chapter 24. Uh, chapter 24 of Ezekiel contains two signs. The first sign is the sign of a rusty cauldron or a rusty pot. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a cooking vessel made out of metal, obviously. And so it's often referred to as a cauldron just because of that. that's what it does. Mm -hmm. The second sign that we'll see involves the death of Ezekiel's wife. Those are the two, two signs that we're going to see. 
uh, tonight. The first one is boiled meat, and that, that begins in the first five verses. Ezekiel says, And the word of the Lord came to me in the ninth year, the tenth month, in the tenth of the month, saying, Son of man, write the name of the day, this very day. The king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. And speak a parable to the rebellious house, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Put on the pot, put it, put it on, and also pour water in it. Put in it the pieces, every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder. Fit it with choice bones. Take the choicest of the flock, and also pile wood under the pot. Make it boil vigorously. Also see its bones in it. God tells uh, Ezekiel to write the name of the day. Now this is before it happens. He's not recording something that's already happened. God says, I want you to write that down and seal it in an envelope. He didn't say that, but he, he wrote it down ahead of time to prove that God told him ahead of time what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that date was January the 15th, 588 B.C. Uh, Denny had it 510, other sources had it 515, but somewhere January, I mean, who do you trust? You can't get it within five days back in 588 B.C. Yeah. But anyway, uh, they can date that pretty carefully just by, the, by the, the way that it's expressed. Now, Ezekiel has been prophesying for about three and a half years. What we've been seeing so far is, is covered about three and a half years. And this event that's, that he's talking about where Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem is so important that it's mentioned twice in Jeremiah uh, when it happens in chapter 39 and then toward the end of Jeremiah there's sort of a review and it's repeated in, in chapter 52 and verse 4 and also in 2 Kings chapter 15 and verse 1. God tells him to take a pot and take choice pieces of, of meat and boil them vigorously. Uh, and that's his instruction then to start out. But then it uh, doesn't go so well because the next verses talk about that pot being rusty. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot in which there is rust, and whose rust has gone out of it. Take out of it piece after piece without making a choice. For her blood is in her midst. She placed it on the bare rock. She did not pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust, that it may cause wrath to come up to take vengeance. I have put her blood on the bare rock, that it may not be covered. That word that's translated rust can refer to something that's sick or something that's diseased, something that's filthy. Uh, it can actually be translated scum. And so this, the, the pot has disease, filth, scum into it. Now that word blood, we, we saw last week that it occurred several times in that chapter, we, that first chapter we looked at last week. And apparently it occurs about 55 times in, in the book of Ezekiel. And so that's a rather common theme. And play it out on the, lay it out on the bare rock. It, you just lay it out for everybody. You know, their, their sin was out in the open. They were flaunting it. They were proud of it. And they didn't pour on the ground and cover it up. Back in Leviticus, the, the instruction was that if you are slaughtering an animal, you pour its blood out on the ground and you cover it up. And that was the instruction. They were totally disregarding everything God had said. Mm. They were not following any of his, his instructions. And so the, the rusty pot represents the fact that you have all the choice pieces thrown in. Everything is in there, but it's, it's polluted because they're just laying their sin out in the open and they don't obey God and they just do whatever they want to. And so in the next few verses, uh, it addresses their filthiness. Notice how many times we, we see uh, the word of the Lord came to me or therefore, thus says the Lord God. And it, it's markers throughout this chapter uh, where it says, therefore, thus says the Lord Woe to the bloody city, I also shall make the pile great. Heap on the wood, kindle the fire, boil the flesh well, and mix in the spices, and let the bones be burned. Then set it empty on its coals, so that it may be hot, and its bronze may glow, and its filthiness may be melted in it, its rust consumed. She, had weary, she has wearied me with toil, let her, yet her great rust has not gone from her. Let her rust be in the fire. And your filthiness is lewdness, because I would, have, I would have cleansed you, but you are not clean. You will not be cleansed from your filthiness again until I have spent my wrath on you. I, the Lord, have spoken. It is coming, and I shall act. I shall not relent, and I shall not pity. I shall not be sorry. According to your ways and according to your deeds, I shall judge you, declares the Lord God. 
God says, just pile it up. Just take it and pile it up because their, their sins are so great. We're just going to pile it up. Their filthiness uh, is melted in the pot and the rust has consumed them. Uh, it, it even indicates that they put some of the bones, the best bones in the pot, but the rest of them they put under the fire to burn up with the fire. This is a total destruction, being totally consumed. The sad part is God said, I would have cleansed you. He was willing to do that, but now it's, it's too late. They're not going to be cleansed until he's through. And some of these statements you do not want to hear from God, and we do not want to hear on Judgment Day God, uh, Jesus say, I do not know you. You do not want God to say, I shall not relent, I shall not pity, I shall not be sorry. Those are words you never want to hear from God. And so he says, you're going to be judged according to your ways and your deeds, which we hope never happens, that we're judged according to our ways and our, our deeds. And as you pointed out Sunday before last, that you know, we're, it's all by God's grace mm -hmm. that we do anything. If we're judged according to our ways and deeds, it's all over. And then the second picture, by the way, it, that's, that first part is described as a parable. And so it's, it's not, he usually takes something and actually does it, but that, that first one says, say this parable to the people. And so it's, it's more of an example than, than an actual event. But this is an actual event mm -hmm. uh, because Ezekiel's wife dies. And you see the extent of, of Ezekiel's faithfulness, how faithful Ezekiel is to, to serving God, uh, no matter what the price is. And the word of the Lord came to me, there's that phrase again, saying, Son of man, behold... I'm about to take from you the desire of your eyes with a blow, but you shall not mourn, and you shall not weep, and your tears shall not come. Groan silently, and make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban, and put on your shoes on your feet, and do not cover your mustache, and do not eat the bread of men. We know that Ezekiel is a sensitive man. He has pled with God before uh, to save people, to not destroy people, and so he's not a hardened individual. He is uh, he's very soft-hearted. And she's described as, as the delight of his eyes. And, and so it's, they had a good relationship. Mm -hmm. And he's told here, don't go into mourning. These are all things that, uh, that people in mourning do. Cover the bottom of your, your, your face, the mustache. Eat the bread of men would be food that people would bring in, you know, to console him. Uh, and he's told, don't show any emotion for what happens to your wife. And so uh, he spoke to the people in the morning, and, and that evening his wife died. And that morning he did just as he was commanded. Teresa? That's the public display of mourning that people have to Yeah, that'd be the public display of mourning. Uh, but I'd, you know, he, who knows what he did at home, but, yeah. but this would have eliminated any public display of, of mourning. They, yeah, he w they would have they would have mourned very obviously, uh, but he is not to do that. He is not to mourn or weep or shed tears, and that is to again show the extent of the destruction. Uh, some commentators say that they weren't able to because of the extent, or they just were told not to. Don't cry about this because you know it's just the, the just consequence for what you deserve. And knowing what was going to happen, he spoke to the people in the morning and his wife died in the evening. Here, the people want an explanation. You can imagine if you're witnessing this, you're going to wonder, what does this mean? What, what the, that's a pretty severe thing to witness, that this man's wife just dies. And he tells you ahead of time she's going to die, and she dies, and then he doesn't mourn for it. In verses 19 through 24, then, the people ask him, Tell us what these things mean. You know, what, let us know what this means for us. And so Ezekiel said to him, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Speak to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am about to profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the desire of your eyes, the delight of your soul, and your sons and your daughters whom you have left behind will fall by the sword. And you will do as I have done. You will not cover your mustache, and you will not eat the bread of men. And your turbans will be on your heads, and your shoes on your feet. You will not mourn and you will not weep, but you will rot away in your iniquities and you will groan to one another. 
Thus Ezekiel will be assigned to you according to all that he has done to you, done you will do. When it comes, then you will know that I am the Lord God. Surprising that people ask to know what this means. I'm surprised they even cared. But God says that I am going to profane my sanctuary. They've been saying, oh, nothing's going to happen to Jerusalem. It's God's sanctuary. And God said, I am myself, I'm going to profane my sanctuary. And you're not going to be able to mourn or weep. You're just going to rot away in your iniquities. You know, it strikes me that how, how many times in the, in the scriptures is, is Israel uh, or God's people, the, the imagery used is, is them being his bride, his, his wife. They are the delight of his eyes. And they have continually rejected him. They have continually um, done everything against what he said he was going to do. And now he takes no delight in the destruction that is coming. And so even as they're being destroyed, his heart is breaking. Yeah. But he's to the point where he has to react as Ezekiel is reacting. And he, he, there's no mourning. He can't, you know, he can't allow himself to mourn or else he'll put a stop to the destruction that they brought on himself. Right. And th this is probably the most graphic illustration of that relationship of, mm -hmm. of the bride uh, you know in Ephesians Paul talks about the church being the bride of Christ but those are just words mm -hmm. uh, Hosea you know his relationship is a is not an ideal one but this is so graphic because the wife actually dies and that's what is what's happened mm -hmm. with Israel is is she's dead mm -hmm. and Jerusalem's dead and it's just a it's just the, I don't know, high point or low point in this story, in this prophecy, when it gets to that point where God says, I will not have mercy, I will not relent. Uh, and, uh, him, yeah, that must be my computer. And then in verses 25 through 27, Ezekiel's mouth is opened. It does not say that it was closed, but the way that it's, it is opened indicates that it must have been closed. He says, as for you, son of man, it will not be on the day when I take from them uh, from their stronghold the joy of their pride, the desire of their eyes and their hearts alight, their sons and their daughters, that on that day he who escapes will come to you with information for your ears. And so what happens is someone, a messenger comes from Jerusalem telling Ezekiel what's happened. Now remember at the beginning of the chapter, Ezekiel's already said this is going to happen on this date, this exact date. But an actual escapee, survivor, will come and give this information to him. And said, on that day your mouth will be open to him who escaped. <coughs> and you will speak and be dumb no longer. And so there's an indication that he has not been able to speak. Although it didn't say you can't speak. And thus you will be assigned to them. And they will know that I am the Lord. He who escapes will come. One, one refugee will come with information. And at that point Ezekiel's uh, mouth will be opened. And he will become a sign. And the result always is that they will know that I am the Lord. The, the next section that you're going to get into, is a, and you'll explain in just a second what, what that section is, but I think it was uh, uh, Jim McGuigan that, that suggested that it is a, uh, an application of this passage in 1 Peter chapter 4. Up till now he's been talking about what's going to happen to Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. But he's going to start talking about other nations. And the, the point is, if this happens to Jerusalem, what about those other people? And in 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, it says, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? So that brings us to Ezekiel chapter 25. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 25 begins a section of the book that pronounces seven, judgment on seven different nations that surrounded, uh, basically surrounded Judah and Israel. Um, and chapter 25 covers the, the first four of those nations that we'll see that, that judgment is being pronounced against and how God is going to deal with those nations. And as we go through, we'll see that, that they're judged for four basic reasons. They were... Um, guilty of inhumane actions. They, they mistreated, um, the commentary said they mistreated people, they mistreated animals, they mistreated the environment. They were just bad folks. They, they were guilty of just poor treatment of whatever they got their hands on. Uh, they're guilty of violation of covenants. Even though God 
did not approve of the covenants often that they made with one another, or that especially if they entered into covenants with Judah and Israel. Once you enter, enter into a covenant, God expects a covenant to be kept. And um, they, it was nothing for them to enter into a covenant that um, would forestall some nation from invading them, perhaps. And then as soon as they had built up their defenses enough, they would violate that covenant and they would go on the attack themselves. So they were constantly violating those things. Um, they worked against Israel and Judah. So they often set themselves in alliance with other powers that came against Israel and Judah, or they themselves were powers that came against Israel and Judah uh, and, uh, and, and sought to, to harm God's people. And then they also are con countries, nations that rejoiced at the demise of God's people. Anytime something bad happened to Judah and Israel, if they were not involved in it themselves, they took delight in it. They were happy that God's people were suffering. And so um, you don't want to set yourself up against God. You don't ever want to take on God, but you don't want to set yourself up against his chosen people either. If God is for somebody, who can be against them, right? But um, they often set themselves up against God's people. So the first section is judgment against Ammon. And Ammon is a country there to the northeast of, of Judah in the orange there. Um, and so that's kind of the region where they were at. And they are descendants of Lot through his youngest daughter. If you look at Genesis chapter 19, that has that story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and they finally are on their way out of the city. And, and uh, as the fire and the brimstone and everything is falling and Lot's wife looks back and she's turned into a pillar of salt. And then Lot was supposed to go to another city, Zoar, I think it was. Um, but Lot got scared. He's like, I've lived in a city and I saw what happened to that city and I don't want to live there anymore. So um, he ends up living in a cave with his two daughters and they think that there's, I mean, they've seen the destruction. They've seen everything that's happened. They think they're the only people left on the earth is what basically the way they present it. And so his daughters, um, through uh, treachery and through uh, causing Lot to become drunk, they end up on alternating nights go into him and they, are, uh, they have his children. So in 1938, we find out that um, Ben Ami was the father of Ammon, and he is the son of Lot's youngest daughter. Um, during the Exodus, in De Deuteronomy chapter two, Israel is commanded not to harm, uh, not to harm the nation of Ammon, and so they uh, make sure that as they're traveling through that region, they don't stray off the path, they don't pluck any grain, they don't uh, desecrate the land, they don't do anything like that. They make sure that they um, have nothing that Ammon can be upset with them for. Uh, there were frequent wars between Ammon and Israel from the time of the judges, and it was um, just a country that they were constantly at conflict with once, the, uh, once they had become settled into their own territory. So our first section here is verses 1 through 7. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward the sons of Ammon, and prophesy against them, and say to the sons of Ammon, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, Aha, against my sanctuary when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel when it was made desolate, and against the house of Judah when they went into exile. Therefore, behold, I'm going to give you to the sons of the east for a possession, and they will set their encampments among you and make their dwellings among you, and they will eat your fruit and drink your milk. And I shall make Rabbah a pasture for camels, and the sons of Ammon a resting place for flocks. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all the scorn of your soul against the land of Israel, therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you, and I shall give you for spoil to the nations. And I shall cut you off from the peoples and make you perish from the lands. I shall destroy you. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. And so I am and rejoiced at the, the destruction of God's temple. Um, they rejoiced at the desolation of the land. They rejoiced at the exile of God's people. Every time something bad happened in Judah, Ammon was there to rejoice and to, uh, to applaud that and to, to take exultation in, in the fact that Judah was suffering. And Ammon's behavior then revealed the condition of their heart. So he says that you rejoiced with the scorn of your heart. So anything that God sets up to be his people to be good, um, if you... Um, disagree with God and you say, well, they shouldn't be the one that God has blessed or they shouldn't be receiving these things and they should, you know, you rejoice any time that they are, are suffering, then that 
put you in opposition to God. And so they are scornful uh, of something that God has established as his own. Because of this, God then would give them to the sons of the east. There were marauding bands of, of nomadic uh, peoples that um, kind of traveled in the eastern regions that were outside of the, um, the reign of Babylon and, and some of the other um, powerful nations. And they were just constant raiders that would come in and, and do damage to Ammon. Um, they would make, he would make Rabbah a pasture for camels. And if you remember back a couple chapters, there was a time when Ezekiel was told to make a waypost, a, a, a way sign for Nebuchadnezzar that he would stop at. And one road would point him to Jerusalem and one ro road would point him to Rabbah. And um, he, he talked about all the different things that Nebuchadnezzar did, his divining and his casting the lots and his looking at the entrails and those things uh, that sent him to Jerusalem. But there was a pronouncement that Rabbah was going to fall. And eventually, Nebuchadnezzar made his way to Rabbah and destroyed that city as the capital of Ammon. <clears throat> he gave them, God was going to give them a spoil to the nations. Um, they, they were just going to be uninhabited by their own people and there were going to be bands of people that would come in and, and take their stuff. And they would be cut off from the peoples. Where is Ammon today? Is there a nation of Ammon? No, I don't know. No, of Ammon, no, they have been cut off. They have lost um, their heritage. They have lost their lineage. There is nothing left of Ammon today. And all of this at the end, thus you will know that I am the Lord. Um, they had set themselves up in opposition to God from, from the time they became a nation. They had constantly opposed God's people. And now finally they would know that God is the Lord because what he had pronounced against them was going to take place. And so it's too late for them to do anything with that knowledge but they do now know that god is the lord and that's a common we've, we've talked about that before it's a common refrain in, in all of the book of ezekiel but it's a common refrain in this chapter as well the next judgment is against moab so we're kind of making a uh, a loop here around judah so moab isn't that cool isn't that cool you can see it it's in it's in purple there straight to the east of the dead sea and the kingdom of Moab, who was, uh, where did Moab come from? Descendants of Lot yep. through his oldest daughter. So yep. same story. Um, the oldest daughter went in to her father one night. The next night they got him drunk again. The youngest daughter went in the next night. And Moab is the, the son of that oldest daughter of Lot. And so um, hostility begins between Moab and Israel even before Israel has their own, their own permanent land. All the way back in the book of Exodus, there was a guy with a funny name um, who talked to a donkey once, didn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and he Balaam was a funny name. Balaam was kind of a funny name. It, I is, thought. it is kind of a funny name. And uh, Balaam, uh, Balaam was acting on behalf of the king of Moab, who wasn't that Balak? Yep. Yeah, Balak. And so, um, so that is where the conflict really, for the first time, is talked about in the scriptures. That here we have Moab who is trying to to seek a. a prophecy or a judgment against Israel before they even take possession of the promised land. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just gets worse from there. Uh, Moab joined with Babylon in attacking Judah. That's recorded in King, 2 Kings chapter 24. Uh, were there any good Moabites? Yes. There was one at There least. was one who was an ancestor of Jesus. That's right. Yeah, Ruth. Uh, so there were some good Moab. Moabites. So, so there were some good Moabites and there were um, there's even a Moabite in the, the lineage of Jesus. So um, so they weren't all bad. No. But by this time, they're pretty well, well all bad. By Ezekiel's time. Yeah. They're, okay. They're, they're, the, the good one left. <laughs> the good one was she went back to Israel. Yeah. So verses eight, <clears throat> verses 8 through 11, thus says the Lord God, because Moab and Seir, and Seir is another word for Edom, and we're going to get to them next, because Moab and Seir say, Behold, the house of Judah is, is like all the nations. Therefore, behold, I'm going to deprive the flank of Moab of its cities, of its cities which are on its frontiers, the glory of the land, Beth Jeshemoth, Baal Meon, and Kiriathame. And I will give it for its possession, give it for a possession, along with the sons of Ammon to the sons of the east, that the sons of Ammon may not be remembered among the nations. Thus I will execute judgments on Moab, and they will know that I am the Lord. So, Moab is guilty of saying, Behold, the house of Judah is like all the nations. Is that the way God viewed the house of Judah? No. God viewed them as special. We, we saw that in Ezekiel chapter 16 when he talked about 
rescuing Israel from, you know, he saw them, her squirming in her blood and all the other nations thought she was nothing, but God saw in her the potential for something uh, beautiful and he nurtured her and she grew into a, a great and beautiful nation. Um, and so Moab says, what's so special about Judah? We don't get it. We don't understand. And it, it's interesting that God sees us differently from the way that others see us because mm -hmm. uh, in their actions, Judah was like all the other nations. Right. But God did not see them that way. In and fact, it, it's, it's a good thing that when God sees us, he doesn't see us as we really are. Yeah. In fact, Judah wanted to be like all the other nations. Yeah. They, that's why they asked for a king in the first place. Make, give us a king so we can be like all the other nations around us. And, and God said, boy, you're missing the point there. But um, Moab thought Judah was like all the other nations, but she wasn't. She no, was her, God's chosen Her people. covenant made her special. Mm -hmm. And the same thing's true of us today. Right. Our covenant makes us special. And right. When he sees us, he sees the blood of Jesus. Right. Although we may, in effect, look like people around us. We don't want to, but... Mm -hmm. uh, he sees us differently, and it, right. it, it was bad for them to say Judah's like everybody else. So Moab had rejected it, uh, that Israel was God's chosen people, and there were three punishments for Moab. She would, God would deprive the flank of Moab from its cities. And so in ancient times, all cities, like the capital of, of Israel was Jerusalem. But there were cities that flanked Jerusalem, like Lachish to the southwest, uh, that was a... It was a military stronghold, and it was there to protect the capital. And so there were um, cities on the flanks or on the outskirts of Moab that were there to protect the capital city. And God said he would deprive them of their flank cities. So, so those cities were raided, and they were conquered by those traveling bands of, of, of uh, marauders that we talked about in the last section. Um, he said he would give it for a possession to the sons of the east. So Moab, again, was going to be invaded and conquered by these uh, bands of people from the east, and they would not be remembered among the nations. So where is Moab today? No ancient city, no no uh, Moabites are, are with us today. Um, so so all of God's prophecies, once again, come true uh, that, that happened against Moab. And then, thus you will know that I am the Lord. Again, it's too late. It It seems to me that if there's a recurring theme in the Bible, we might be able to say that everybody at some point is going to know that God is the Lord. Mm -hmm. The thing we want to make sure of is that we know that before it's too late. Mm -hmm. And with Moab and with Ammon, they learned it, but they learned it too late. And there was nothing then that they could do about it. And so we have the opportunity in our lives to learn it and to know it and to live it and to appreciate it. But if we don't do that in this life, then we will eventually know it, but then it will be too late. Every knee, will every, bow. Knee will bow. every knee will bow. Every knee, every person will acknowledge at some point that there is a God and that He is who the Bible teaches He is. That will be acknowledged at some point by every person who has ever lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Third judgment is against Edom, and Edom is there to the south of Israel, to the south of the Dead Sea, in the yellow down below, um, a big desert region, and Edom. Who, who is who was responsible for Edom? That has something to do with red. It does. It has to do with the, the word red. Yep. And uh, you remember the story of Jacob and Esau when Esau thought he was going to die of hunger, and Jacob had some some uh, lentil soup, and um, it was a red soup, and Esau said, "Give me some of that stuff you've got there." Some and, of that red stuff. Yeah, some of that red stuff, and. Jacob said, if you'll give me your birthright. And so Esau did. And from then on, he was called Edom. It says that in Genesis chapter 25, 30. So his name was, his nickname was given to him as Edom because he traded his birthright for some red stuff. So Edom is the descendants of Esau. So verses 12 through 14 say, thus says the Lord God, because Edom has acted against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and has incurred grievous guilt and avenged themselves upon them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off man and beast from it, and I will lay it waste. From Teman even to Dedan, they will fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. Therefore, they will act in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath. Thus, they will know my vengeance, declares the Lord God. 
So God lists Edom's sins. She acted against Judah with vengeance. How does God feel about people taking vengeance for themselves? He does not like that at all. He does not like that. He t- says something somewhere in the New Testament about that, well, doesn't he? In Romans 12 and 13 and 12, it talks about leave room for the wrath of God. Right. Vengeance, Vengeance is mine, mine, says the Lord. the Lord, I will repay. And so whether Judah's slights against Edom were real or were perceived is irrelevant. Doesn't matter how Judah acted toward Edom. If Edom took vengeance on Judah, whether it was, uh, there is no justified vengeance Mm -hmm. in God's eyes. And so um, when Edom acted against Judah with vengeance, she was taking God's prerogative. She was uh, putting herself in the position of God. And so she incurred grievous guilt. Not only did she uh, act with vengeance, but she did so in a way that um, that was abhorrent. She uh, she acted in in very immoral and impure ways in taking that vengeance. Um, so even if it was a justified vengeance, which it wasn't, but even if they could justify it, the way they went about it was uh, was sinful. God's punishment then would involve stretching out His hand against them. Never a good thing. Um, It would cut off man and beast, so there would be nothing left of them. He would lay it waste, and Israel would be an instrument of God's vengeance against Edom. Um, And that does eventually happen. Even um, It was down several hundred years after Ezekiel, but it's to the time, I think, of the Maccabees when uh, there was uh, a rebellion and, and the Israelites went in and helped the army that came in and destroyed Edom. Israel was part of that army. And they had their final vengeance against Edom because at that point they were removed and and never again heard from. And this one ends a little different than the other ones. The other ones ended, thus they shall know that I am the Lord. And this one ends, thus they will know my vengeance. So what's the the deal here? That's really bad. It is bad. Um, I I wonder about that. And I wonder about, um, I mean... Is their destruction ultimately any different or any worse than Ammon and Moab? I wouldn't think I don't so. Think the, so. You know, Lord implies master that, that mm-hmm. you will acknowledge that I am in charge. Right. And this may just be a different aspect of that same idea that I'm re- I'm responsible for the end result. Whatever happens, I make right. it happen. And so, yeah, I think it, it's just a, a similar pronouncement. I don't think there's a lot of difference between thus you'll know that, that I'm the Lord and thus you'll know my vengeance. Kind of like you said a while ago, we don't. Uh, we, there are certain things we don't want to hear. We don't ever want to be in a position where God, you know, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We don't ever want to be on the receiving end of that. And it may just be the way God uses words because he's talking about their vengeance and them right. taking vengeance. Right. And this is just the counterpart of that is they will know my vengeance mm-hmm. because of the vengeance they've taken right. against my people. Okay. And our fourth nation for this chapter is Philistia. And we're kind of, if you notice, we're kind of making a, a half circle here. We started with Ammon down to Moab and then Edom, and now we're turning back to the, to the northeast, uh, to Philistia, and getting over to this um, coastal territory. Philistines were of no relation to Israel. They were descendants of Phil. <laughs> yeah? You didn't know that, did you? I did not. I missed that. A, I missed that page. It, it is, it's book. a little known fact that is they it, are the descendants of I think it's very film. little known. Yeah. Um, There's only one person that knows it. Yeah. Uh, there was no relation. <laughs> Ammon and Moab were related through Abraham's nephew Lot. And then Esau was related through, or Edom was related through Jacob and Esau. So there is no history there. And their, um, their ancestry is somewhat... It's speculative. They may have come from Cyprus. They may have come from uh, somewhere else along the Mediterranean and moved in. But they were a they were a seagoing people, and they were a uh, kind of a coastal uh, economy is the way they they survived. There are, there are a couple of schools of thought among historians, archaeologists. There's a group of people called the Sea People, mm-hmm. and some say that the the Philistines are the Sea People, and some people say no, they're they're not. But yeah. but they probably did come from around Greece, Cyprus, in that area. Yeah and uh, did operate in the sea and kind of worked their way down the, the coast there. Right. And so they, they, that's probably where they came from. Uh, did they ever have conflict with Israel? You bet. Oh, my land. I mean, they there did. was a little boy named David. Yes. 
down and, by uh, the babbling brook and a goliath yeah. uh, figure that's one famous story but there were lots of conflicts through the through the years with philistia there was a stolen ark of the a covenant stole, and and they made uh, boils out of gold uh, and sent it and mice and the mice yeah because that, they were plagued with those things while they had the ark um, and their God fell over in his temple and his head and his hands and his feet Yeah, the fell second off. time down, he yeah. didn't survive. Yeah, so that was a good day for Israelites. Yep. Verses 15 through 17 of chapter 25. Thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines have acted in revenge and have taken vengeance with scorn of soul to destroy with everlasting enmity, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, even cut off the Carathites or Cherethites, which do you think? Well, it's Cherethites unless okay. you're speaking Italian, that's Carathites. Okay, well, I don't know Italian, so Cherethites it is. And destroy the remnant of the seacoast. And I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes, and they will know that I am the Lord when I, take my ven- when I lay my vengeance on them. So, the Philistines were guilty of the following, motivated by revenge. Sound familiar? Mm-hmm. Sounds like the Edomites. They were motivated by revenge. They took vengeance on the Egyptians. Uh, they had taken vengeance in a way that revealed the scorn of their souls, similar to the way, um, similar to the phrase that was used to describe the Edomites as well. And God's punishment involves stretching out his hand, similar to the Moabites, cutting off the Cherethites. Now, the Cherethites... Either a sub were either a subsect of the Philistines, a subgroup of the Philistines, or perhaps related to their um, place of origin, if it had to do with Cyprus or somewhere um, further up the coast. Um, but but they would have understood the direct connection between Cherethites and Philistines, even if it's been lost to us. And he would destroy the remnant of the sea coast. If you are a seafaring and and a people that rely on the sea coast for your livelihood and God is going to destroy the seacoast, then that pretty well tells you your fate. And God would execute great vengeance on them that they, and then said, they will know that I am the Lord. Um, so it's through his vengeance that he's going to make himself known as the Lord through to the, the Philistines. More to come next week. You know, more to come. There's more, uh, there's lots more um, detail given about Tyre and yeah, Sidon. Yeah, I noticed they're... then... Uh, here we have four of them yeah. occupying one chapter. Entire gets two or three, three chapters, yeah, doesn't it? it yeah. Multiple chapters. So, and so more to come. Before we get to our questions, mm-hmm. the all of these are on our YouTube channel. We're, we're a week or two behind, I think. But if you go to YouTube and look for McPherson Church of Christ, it has different channels, different. Uh, groupings right and you can see all of the the studies about psalms you can see all the proverbs you can see all the ones of daniel up to a certain point you can tell all your friends and they could start watching it but it's all go viral we could go viral i'm surprised we haven't gone viral already (laughs) really yeah maybe someday we'll go viral maybe so do you have any questions for him? There's always questions. I, I was trying, I was yelling at the TV last week when I was watching and you were asking me about questions. Yeah. Even though I wasn't here. Didn't I say I was, that he was there yelling yeah. at the TV? I was, he was yeah. Hey, I want those questions there. Yep. Yeah. I'm glad you're feeling better. Me too. What is the meaning of the parable of the meat and the rusty pot? What is it talking about? The people... The Israelites are there, and they represents their re- sin, their yeah. sins, and the the pot is rusty. It's diseased. It's nasty, and it just everything is defiled. You throw in good meat, but it just comes out nasty. And then after it's empty, you still leave the pot on there to burn some more. God's uh, God's punishment is going to be thorough. Mm-hmm. It's going to be more than just turn on the heat on the. In the pot, it's going to be when the pot's empty, it's going to keep on cooking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a destructive fire. This is uh, this is a major fire. Uh, it uh, it doesn't end. It just it just keeps on until everything has been consumed. There's a new kind of potato chip out now, and you buy one in a package. Oh. It's a ghost, this, that ghost pepper. Something like that. It's, yeah. 
it's and so, not habanero yeah well habaneros is that's mild that's like a bell pepper compared to this stuff yeah uh and so if you want to bring that next week and try it for us i don't okay <laughs> that but that would have been a good object lesson for tonight on <laughs> on that pot just burning and burning and burning it, it keeps would, on burning it wouldn't yeah i'm sorry we missed the opportunity that might be one way we could go viral i guess uh, we could probably go viral <laughs> if we'd eat one of those not chips for the right reasons I guess uh, one of the basketball players ate one, thought it'd be an easy thing to do, and he was crying. Yeah, they're not happy. Uh, so anyway, that's that's the kind of heat we're talking about. Tracy? I think it's interesting, going through the study of Judaism, how many times God is talking about the, how evil the Israelites had become. And really, it started early. It was talking about the, we need to get rid of the household gods from Yeah, and that's a good point that in Ezekiel as much as anywhere, maybe in Jeremiah and, and Lamentations, but the, the pictures in Ezekiel are very graphic. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't pull any punches and even, even images can't do full justice to what they did. But you're right, if you go back to, they, they came out of or the Chaldees with their idols, and they carried them with them. With them, they came out of Egypt and added those idols, and they went into Canaan and they added those idols. And you see God's patience, and He was patient, and patient, and patient. But there was a time when His patience ended, and He said, "I will not wait any longer." And as we as we saw, Ezekiel's been prophesying for three and a half years. But in this. In the, in the first chapter that we talked about tonight, God says, this is it. This is where I have been headed, and this is what's going to happen. But then you see how that doesn't excuse those other nations around them. Uh, just because God's people chose to, to behave that way does not mean it's okay for those others. They're the ones that taught them all that stuff. Now, they're the ones that, uh, Moab and those others that came up with these idols and, and these different things. And so you're right, it, it's... It's interesting how graphic it becomes. And I think that just demonstrates what it means to God. And I don't know how it can get more graphic than your wife's going to die and you're not going to be able to do anything about it. And you, that, I was going to say, even, even the good kings of, of Judah, this, the final statement about them usually is, and he reigned 47 years, but he didn't remove the high places, or he didn't, he didn't do this, or he didn't do that. Is there is there any one of the good kings? Maybe there's one of them. Jos Hezekiah it, and Josiah did. Hezekiah and Josiah did remove the they high places. They did remove the high places, and it makes and they, a point of that. And one of them even had um, it was is it Hushtan the the idol that they had made an idol the, out of the snake the that snake, Moses yeah. had created. So even think of how I mean we revere David. David was a man after God's own heart, and he was a good king. But even David didn't get rid of all the high places. No, and. Uh, yeah, his wife had a household idol yeah. right there. Uh, but you'd have to get down to, to Josiah and, and Hezekiah and Josiah and the other kings. These were good kings, but. Yeah. And so they, just, they never were thorough in their obedience to God. And that, that, that's the meaning of that, that parable of the meat and the rusty pot is that they were just filthy. And what is the application of the death of Ezekiel's wife? What does that mean? The people said, what does that mean to us? But what does that mean to us today? in the 21st century hmm. would it come come a point that god says that i'm gonna you're gonna be wiped out and nobody's even gonna lament the fact we are we are the bride of christ but it is possible for us to be so disobedient to god that that marks the end of that relationship uh, so we, we need to always be vigilant If it happens to them, what will happen to the, the disobedient? And that, that's just a very good prelude to these chapters that we're seeing. If, if, if this happens to Judah, what do you think is going to happen to all those other countries around there? Uh, two more questions. Why were these foreign nations slated for God's judgment? They did bad stuff. 
they did bad stuff. And there were a list of four things that the kind yeah. of general things that right. they they did. Uh, and one of the the main ones that, that shows up is they took delight in in the, the misfortune of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what, and God, everybody that that, that deserves punishment is going to be punished. But God does not intend for us to take delight in that fact. Mm -hmm. And even back earlier in Ezekiel, he said that does God have delight, you know, in, in people dying? No, he he has delight in, in people repenting and turning around. Mm -hmm. They were slated for, for for judgment because of what they had done and because of the delight that they took in Israel's destruction. And the last question Which of the three nations were related to Israel? They were Ammon, Moab. And Edom, Ammon and Moab, who were descendants of Lot. Lot. Edom, who were descendants of Esau. And so they had these other countries around that they were their cousins. Yep. But uh, and the only one that was not related to them was Philistia. Philistia. The, the descendants of descendants Phil. of Phil. You know, I I like that we were able to put a map up and show that. It always reminds me of our of our dear sister uh, Velma Listum. When um, years ago, one time Glenn and Glenn and I went and, and visited with her one afternoon, and she was talking about Bible study and how she had studied the Bible through the years, and it was her thought that you can't properly study the Bible without a map next to you. She and, is absolutely correct. Yeah. And so, imagine you know trying to study Ezekiel chapter twenty-five and the, the judgment of these nations, and not knowing anything about the nations and where they were and how they related to Israel. So. Um, I always think of her whenever we're using maps. And she was exactly correct. She was. I feel a buzzer coming on pretty soon. I think they'll be saved by the bell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You like our new technology? Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah, it's I cool. can go backward. I can do it. I can control it from my computer. I can, I can make circles. The expense of their toys. Yeah. Okay. It's easier to read on this, isn't it? Yeah. And then you can you can also see what's coming up and know what to anticipate. Okay. How do I unconnect? Right there, I think. So. Hi there. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. a good thought. Yeah. Yeah. And we, uh, yeah, originally we tried to get people to talk to the microphone. That didn't work. Nobody would just volunteer. So we could, yeah, yeah we could try yeah. to speak. Mm -hmm. We should try to do that. Yeah, I feel like last week at least, I was like, there was a couple times where like, people said like really long things, and Davey and I were just sitting there and we're like, <laughs> yep. I was like, I think Chuck's talking, but I can't hear him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How you doing? Oh, okay, good. I was disappointed at the end. He talked about being in jail in Germany, in Nazi Germany. Yeah. He mentioned nothing about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Is that the way you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, he was executed in the house. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I was going to mention, I was going to ask you something. Uh, when you're talking about. Uh, uh, you know, you guys talking about the Philistines. I need something to do. The the <laughs> I was curious. Uh, you remember the page you used? Uh, see part of Israel and renamed it. Did he rename it Palestine? Palestine. And, and that was in reference to the Philistines, wasn't it? Yeah. Exactly. That's what I thought he was doing intentionally. That's the reason he named it Right. Well, I mean, it's, and the Palestinians have always claimed that that's, that's their area, but 
but like you said, I mean, uh, history has always proven that the most the most that we can figure out from these things is that they were seafaring people that came either down the coast or across the uh, Mediterranean. But uh, I was just curious because I didn't the, the word Palestine and Philistine are very similar, but I didn't know if it was the, the same reference. Yeah, yeah, but I thought it was. Yeah. Oh well, I mean, uh, you know, the Romans and the uh, their opposition with Israel. You know, Israel invented it, and Rome was not. Uh, they were very hostile to the Jewish people. Yeah, well, uh, you know, that was the thing about uh, Rome in, in the beginning. Well, if what little I do seem to know, I didn't tell you a whole lot, but it seems as though that when they went in and conquered an area, they were very brutal in the initial. But then it was, you guys have your own customs, things like that. You can run yourselves, just maintain some order. Is that, is that, that's a key thing to do with order. Right. 